for those of you that have just joined, uh, I'm just going to quickly fly through what we're going to be covering today. So essentially, we have our main Digimap model. Most of you will know how to uh, produce this already if you've been in another one of my classes. Uh, but we're going to be taking it quite a big step further today. So this is where you can download most of the data from uh, Digimap to produce accurate terrain models. You can get your 3D extruded buildings. Uh, you can get maps to project. You can get accurate vectors. And the point of this is that it's all to an accurate scale and it's all geolocated. So this is what we'll use as our main base. I'm also going to show you how to bring in uh, Google Map data. So again, if no matter where you look online, everyone will tell you that you cannot bring this data into Rhino. Clearly, you very much can. And again, this type of stuff is going to be great for your visuals, your animations, your fly throughs, stuff like that. And then lastly, we're going to be taking a look at bathymetry data. So bathymetry data is everything that's below the sea, anything below sea level. Um, and this same process that I'll show you for this one also works for the LiDAR data sets as well. So just really nice to know. So now that we know the main types of models we're going to be working with today, obviously you can combine these together at the end. Now that we know that, we're going to go straight to Digimap. I'm just going to quickly go back a step because I was forgetting to record when I first started this. So navigate yourselves to digimap.adena.ac.uk. I'm just going to click on login. And for me, it just logs straight in. But for you, it's going to ask you uh, to enter the name of your university, which of course for us is Manchester School of Architecture or Manchester Metropolitan. Um, and if it's your first time accessing it, you just want to accept the license agreements at the very top of the screen. Uh, and this is going to grant you access to all of these uh, data sets. And we've already subscribed to all of these for you. So it's nice and straightforward. Uh, the main data sets we're going to be looking at today is going to be the Ordnance Survey, which was the first map that I showed you, the kind of more basic looking one. But this is where you get the most accuracy in your data. So we're going to work with this one quite heavily. We're also going to be looking at the marine data set. This one's for the bathymetry data, anything that's below sea level. I'm going to show you how to process that with QGIS and Rhino. Um, the same process also works for LiDAR because it gives you the same data types. So just follow the same process through. It will work for these. Um, there's a few other data sets you could look at. So for instance, global, if it's not the UK that you're looking at, you will find a lot of data sets for other countries. But this is a relatively new service, so you won't always be able to find it. But if you're looking specifically for bathymetry data or 3D scanned terrain data, just hunt around online. Sounds silly, but hunt around online. Most governments will have access to uh, point cloud data for their countries, and they usually provide it for free online for surveying purposes. So you can access that stuff. Um, final one to make a note of would be aerial. For those of you that are looking to do any kind of photogrammetry models uh, of sites, again, this type of stuff could also be really useful. It's essentially just a collection of 3D aerial maps that you can download run into something like Autodesk Recap and process it out as a 3D model. Now, I'm personally not going to be showing that method today because I don't think it's the most accurate for what we're doing today. I'm also going to be doing a separate session uh, towards the end of this term uh, on how to process drone data because we're buying a drone for the school, which is pretty cool. Um, and essentially what we're going to be doing with that is we're going to be using the drone to capture data in real time, mostly image and video, and we'll process that through photogrammetry which is the same process for this aerial map. Right, now that I've got all of that out of the way and we've caught back up, I'm going to go to Ordnance Survey and I'm going to go to Data Download. So again, really straightforward uh, to set this up, um, especially if it's your first time. You know, you're not going to have too many problems with this, I don't think. But I think the site that I'm going to be using is going to be our campus. So I'm going to type in Manchester School of Architecture. I'm just going to get the postcode for it. I'm going to search for that postcode and it's going to bring me to the school. So this is somewhere in Manchester city centre. As you see, I can zoom in a bit. And I can see a bit cleaner, a bit more uh, better detail. So not a huge amount to note here, really. All you need to do is select the area that you want to bring in. And I would always recommend that you go a little bit bigger than you need. Just always good practice. So for instance, if my site is this one, uh, this is all Saints Park just here. 
This is where the Chatham building is, where we have most of our lectures. But I'm going to select a bit of a bigger area just because I want to show you some of the limitations. So for instance, we know that we've got that big fly through bridge, fly over bridge even. I'm going to show you what happens when we download that. Right, <clears throat> so in terms of data that we're going to download, there's quite a few data sets that we can use to build our models. So the very first one is going to be this topography data set under OS master map. Uh, and essentially what this is, you see the, the file format is just DWG. Again, most of you might be familiar with DWG. It's a standard AutoCAD file format, uh, but essentially it just means it's vector data. So we can import that into AutoCAD, 3ds Max, Revit, Vectorworks, and of course, Rhino, which we'll be using today. And the whole point of this is that it's a scaled vector map with hatches, with text and data. Uh, it gives us lots of information about our site and it's stuff that's going to help us to build our model. Now, one thing that's worth noting on this is the scale. So a lot of people will have a look at the scale and they'll think this means this is the scale this is going to download at. No, it's not how this works. Essentially, the scale here represents the level of detail. So the level of detail this will download at is appropriate at 1 to 1 to 50. So I'm going to talk to you about the actual scale in a minute. So essentially, I'm going to download this. I'm happy with that. The next one I'm going to download is the building height attributes. This gives us all of the 3D buildings as block extrusions for the site. And again, the level of detail is 1 to 2,500. Doesn't mean it's going to download at that scale. Now, while we're talking about scale, um, essentially the way this downloads is the units themselves aren't specified. So what I mean by this is if you were to create a new Rhino document or AutoCAD document for that matter, uh, and if you were to set your units to millimeters, this would come in at one to 1000 scale. If you set your units to meters, it would come in one to one scale. Um, and typically that's the way that these guys like to work. They prefer to work in meters just because it's very, very large data sets. Uh, but of course, being architecture students, we tend to mostly work in millimeters in the UK. So that's why I just mentioned the discrepancy between the two. And essentially all it means is if you wanted to work in millimeters, when you import all of this data, you import it all in and you don't move anything until you've built the model. And only at the very end do you scale it up by a factor of 1000. And then that would get it back to one to one. So again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. We, we will scale it up together. But I just wanted to throw that out there first. Um, I'm going to go down to the next section. So this is backdrop mapping. Um, now that we know that this is going to download at 1 to 1000 in millimeters, that means I would probably want to use a 1 to 1000 raster map. Uh, it's not essential this step, but this is just in case you want to do any kind of texture mapping uh, to put the map onto your 3D terrain, like a nice colored map. So I, I always download this one. It's going to minimize those two. We've then got land and height data. And this is possibly the most important data set we're going to be using. So a lot of people tend to go for OS Terrain 5 contours. And as you'll see, this gives you all of the nice contour map information. I'm sure this is how most of you are already working. But the problem with this is that a lot of the data in between these contours is being missed out. So it's only going to give you um, kind of steps between every five meters. It's what the five in OS Terrain 5 represents. Um, we can, of course, download this in DWG. It is just vector information, and each layer is at their correct height because it's all geolocated. But again, the problem is that we don't get to see what happens between these. So I'm actually not going to download this one. I'm going to go ahead and download OS Terrain 5 DTM. And DTM stands for Digital Terrain Model. And the file type we want to download this as is XYZ, because this is uh, accepted by Rhino. For those of you that are planning to use this with SketchUp or Vectorworks or Revit, I recommend you just bring this data set into Rhino first, process it, export it out, bring it into your other software. It, it will still work that way. Um, the reason we're going to use this one, as you can see in, uh, from the image, the level of detail is significantly higher. And the reason for that is that the way it basically creates a grid across it, across the site, um, you get a nice equal distribution of points. And the height data for each of these is very, very accurate. I believe uh, to the nearest 25 centimeters. 
So it's, it's about as accurate as you get without doing your own surveys. So I'm going to tick the OS Terrain 5 DTM box. And I think that's pretty much it. So the data sets we've got, just to recap, is OS Terrain 5 DTM. We've got the master map 1 to 1000, building height attribute, and topography. Of course, if there's any other types of data that you want to map onto your 3D model, by all means, feel free to download any extra ones like green space, waterways, etc. Um, but we're not going to worry about those too much today. Final thing just to mention here is the number of tiles selected. So at the moment, all of my data is fitting within a single tile. It says one out of 400 available. Um, this is definitely preferable because otherwise we'll have to bring in multiple data sets. So multiple tiles, trim them down, join them together, etc. But we're using just a single tile. Uh, I'm going to click on Add to Basket. And now we're going to set these up. So I've got my four main data sets that we're going to download. Topography, we're going to do as DWG. Building height attribute, we're going to do as DWG. Our uh, image that we're going to map on to the terrain after, we'll keep that as a TIFF because you can't change it. And the OS Terrain 5 DTM, we're going to do as an XYZ. I'm going to get you to screenshot this in a minute, just so you've got this kind of saved. Uh, the only extra thing we can change is for the topography layer, that flat vector map we were talking about. So if you were to choose standard, this is going to download all of the vectors and text uh, and everything all to scale, but it's also going to include the colored hatches, which I personally find really useful to work out where green spaces are, roads are, buildings are, etc. Um, but if you're running a particularly slower computer that struggles with hatches, you could just choose to download the plan version. And it's the exact same data set, just minus the hatches. So good to know. If you wanted to download both, you could always click on Add More Data, come back to Topography and add it to Basket, set it, oh, set it to DWG again, and then you just set that one to Plan. So then you're downloading the same data set twice, but just with different themes. I'm then going to give this a name. Oh. Uh, MSA model one, let's call it. Click on request download. And then we wait very patiently for the emails to go. Now, because we're running a live workshop and because I'm basically just flying through this process today, uh, just to give you an idea of how these things come together, um, I've already downloaded this data set. I'm just going to close these models down. Let's get rid of all of these. Um, and I'm just going to quickly navigate to my folder and bring it back. There we go. Beautiful. Right, so the one that I've just downloaded is the Digimap data set. And once it downloads, because essentially you get an email with a download link, when it downloads, you're going to get this download.zip file. Ignore the other folders for now. These are other models. Uh, and essentially, Ah, good question from Cameron there. Uh, how long do the emails usually take to come through? Um, they can take, essentially it depends on how much data you're downloading and how many people are accessing it. The quickest I've seen it come through was about 60 seconds. The longest was about three hours. Uh, just where I've had like an entire class trying to access it all at once. So again, you might need to wait a little while for that download. Um, but once you've got it, essentially what you need to do is uh, right click your zip file and extract it. Or if you're using WinRAR like me, you might want to double click and choose exactly which files to extract. Looks something like this. You don't have to use this. You can just right click and extract. Um, that's if you're on Windows. If you're on a Mac, it will automatically just download as a folder. You won't need to unzip it. If you're on Windows, you absolutely have to unzip it because otherwise Rhino is not going to be able to reference uh, the data sets inside correctly. You're going to end up with a very, very badly corrupted model. So extract that first. Now that we've extracted it, I can open the folder up. And you see I've now got multiple folders inside with all of my different data sets. So I've got the 1 to 1000 map, which looks like this. So this is my TIFF image for the area that I'll map onto the terrain at the end. I've got my building heights, which is in there as a DWG file. 
We've got the topo plan, which is also DWG. Topo standard, also DWG. Remember the difference is whether they have a hatch or not. I did also download the uh, OS Terrain 5 as a DWG. This was the contours when I downloaded it yesterday. I've downloaded the Terrain 5 DTM, which is our XYZ data type for our points, for our accurate terrain. So I'm sure most of this is probably going over your head a bit, but please remember this is being recorded. You can watch this back whenever you need to. Key thing is just to be taking some notes for now about key uh, file types and things. Right, now that we've got that, I'm going to open Rhino. So I'm just going to give that a second to open a clean version of Rhino. And the key thing we need to do is try and decide early on whether we're going to work in millimeters or meters. So again, if you're working in millimeters, it means that the Digimap uh, data will need to be scaled up by 1000 at the very end of the model building process. If you choose meters, it means it's already one to one. So a little bit confusing if you struggle with uh, scale on digital software, but you get the hang of it. I'm going to go ahead and do millimeters. I always prefer millimeters. Uh, Cameron's just asked, is the data that I'm using now available on Moodle at all so you can follow along? Um, I'm going to be going at such a rapid pace that I wouldn't be expecting you to follow along live today. Uh, the key thing for this one would just simply be to make notes for now and then watch it back step by step so you can pause it at the end. I hope that's okay. Um, again, the data sets you could just download directly from uh, Digimap for now. I mean, I, I can upload it, but you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be quite quick. <laughs> If you want me to quickly add it into the chat. Do you want me to quickly add the data? Because what I can do, give me two secs, I'll very quickly upload it to Teams. Um, only take me a second to do. Right, it's just uploading now. Give me two secs. Hopefully it's uploading. Yes. Right, what I've done, sorry, too many screens going on. What I've done, if you go to our main um, ADD Teams page, go to the session that we're doing now, Ultimate Guide to 3D Site Models, click on Files at the top, you'll find that same zip uh, data that I'm using today. So hopefully that will give you what you need. It's a relatively small file, if it's like 30, 40 meg, something like that. I am going to plow straight into the next bit, though. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to bring in the 2D vector map first, because it comes in with lots of layers that we're going to quickly clean up. I've got a bit of a process for that that should speed up the process. Then we're going to bring in the terrain data, and we're going to clean that up. And then lastly, we'll bring in the 3D buildings, and that will give us our complete model. So that's going to be the process. So to build my model, I'm going to go to File and Import. And I'm going to navigate to where I've saved my data, where I extracted it to. And I'm actually going to bring in the one that has all of the hatches. So I'm going to bring in the master map topo standard. Now, one thing uh, to note when you're importing things, if you can't find the data set that you're looking for, double check that you've set your uh, filter your import filter to all supported files. Otherwise, if it's on a different file type, you'll see just nothing appears. So set it to supported files, you'll be able to access all of your data types. Um, it will pop up with a little import window. I'm just going to click OK. We're going to keep all of this exactly the same. And as you see, it says it's imported successfully in my command line, but currently I can't see any of my data. So I'm going to type in the command Z-E-A, zoom extends all. I'm going to hit enter. And what this does, it just zooms out to the full extents of the drawing. Because this isn't going to import near your 0, 0 coordinate, it's going to import into its real world coordinates because it's geolocated. So that's our first thing that we're going to be uh, looking at. Now, I can't stress enough, do not move any of this data around. As soon as you start moving this left or right, back and forth, up or down, you're going to break the model. Again, because everything's going to come in at the same scale and geolocated, 
It means that when I bring in my terrain, it's going to match my map. When I bring in my buildings, they'll be in the same location as the map. Everything comes into the same place. As soon as you move anything, you break those relations. You can move it at the very, very end if you want to. Um, right, we're going to look at layers first. So if I click on my layers tab just on the right, you'll see if I just pull this out a bit, we have way too many layers that just make this whole process messy. So we're just going to quickly go through and clean these up first. We're going to get it down to a single layer, but without deleting any geometry. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to select my layers one to five. So I'm clicking on the first layer, holding shift, clicking on layer five. And I'm just going to delete these. So I can just right click and choose to delete those layers. <clears throat> so that gets rid of the first few because they're, they're, well, that's not part of the map. They're just the default ones that come in with that Rhino template that I chose. Now, a good way to organize these, which is even better than the last time I showed this, um, is to look at the final word. So you might need to drag your layers out and adjust your kind of sliders here to see the full names of the words. But the key thing is just to look at the final names of each layer. So for instance, anything that says area, we're going to move those to an area layer. Anything that says line, we're going to uh, move that to like a line layer and so on and so forth. So I'm going to click on new layer. And just in capitals, just so I can find it easier, I'm going to type a layer, name it area. And now I've got a layer called area. And now all I need to do is start selecting all of my layers that end with the word area. And again, you can hold shift to select multiple. So I think that's the final one there. I'm just selecting multiple. I'm just going to click and drag these and place that onto my nice new area layer. And I can minimize that down. So it's, all it's doing, it's, it's not breaking any of the geometry. We're not deleting anything. We're just all organizing it into subfolders because they're all still in there. Plus, it now means I can turn these off. So straight away, I've cleaned up all my hatches. I've got them into a single button that I can toggle on and off. So it definitely speeds up my, uh, my file much quicker. For those of you that have ever tried opening Digimap stuff on AutoCAD, you'll know just how slow AutoCAD is at processing Digimap. This is why I prefer to use Rhino because it handles the same data, but so much faster. You could always clean up your drawings here and then bring them back to CAD after. So I'm just going to quickly go through. I'm just going to finish cleaning these up. Oh, I want to do this as capitals. So I'm going to make a layer called line. Anything that has line at the end, I'm going to move to my line layer. Uh, you will end up with a few layers that basically don't have anything in particular at the end. And I'll show you what to do with those. Um, I think that's pretty much it. There's another one there. It doesn't matter if I've missed one or two. Uh, I'm now going to do one called text. So again, it's a little bit of a manual process, but it's not that stressing, really. It's not too taxing. Um, so text, 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 text. Move that to text layer. As you see, this is getting much, much cleaner now. I can see there's a bunch called point. So I'm going to make another one called point. All of these are point ones. I think that's about as good as that's going to get. Oh, I missed one called area. Let's add that into there. Another one called point. Another one there called point. OK, and now I'm left with a few that just kind of don't match anything else, right? So all I would do for these, this one that says building division, I'm going to right click on this, select the objects. And I'm just going to look at the type of geometry that's selected. So quite clearly, just by visually looking, I can see this is line type data. So I need to move this layer to my line layer. Um, and again, if I were to double check in properties, or if I were to double check in my command line, it tells me what's selected there as well. It's all line type data. So my building division goes to layer line. Same thing for my building outline layer, clearly all vector geometry. So that's going to move to my line layer. I'm not sure about this one. Yep, that's more curves. We're going to add that to line. 
I think it's all pretty much line type geometry, to be honest. Select all boundaries. Yep, more curves. Let's add that. So then we've got this one. Boundary half meeting, if I'm reading that correct. Um, I'm not really seeing what this is because currently it's a block and we're not going to be exploding blocks just yet. But to me, this looks like a symbol. So sometimes when you download Digimap data, you get symbols. So I'm just going to make a final layer, call it symbol. And I'm just going to drag that into it. Turn that one off. Um, you end up with um, your default and zero layers. Again, you can keep these exactly as they are, and you can shift these layers up and down just with these up and down buttons. If you wanted to reorganize things, that's also fine. But the key thing with this is we've now got it nice and clean. Uh, we're going to get it even cleaner in a sec, but just before we do, I'm going to turn on my line layer again, because this is going to be really useful data later on. Now, one thing to note with this is at the moment, a lot of the geometry has dashed lines. So for instance, if I zoom into this road just here, you see I don't actually have very clean boundaries. It's all kind of dashed line work. So what I would do with this is I would select all of the line work on that line layer. You might need to, to uh, select sub layer objects if you have multiple layers inside your grouped layer. So with all of that line work selected, you could also just select like this. That's also fine. Uh, with all of that selected, I'm just going to go to my properties tab. I'm going to go to line type. And instead of having a mixture of layers, I'm just going to set everything to be continuous. And what this does, it now cleans up all of that line work. So if I just undo that a step, you see how it was before. I've seen lots of people spending literally a couple of weeks going around redrawing these bits back in to clean this stuff up. Um, but obviously the much faster way is just to select it all, change the line type to continuous. Much, much, much faster. Now that we've done that, final step would just be to make one more layer and we call it map. And all of those other layers, we're just going to drag into our map layer. And now we've got it cleaned up like this. Much, much, much nicer to work with. So that's the whole first step. That is probably the most time consuming part of this whole process is cleaning up that vector map. But now we got it. We got a nice clean vector map that's geolocated and accurate with our proper building plots and everything. If I needed to double check where any geometry is, I could just check, turn on my um, area layer and it will show me all the hatches. So straight away, I can find All Saints Park, for instance. Um, so really, really useful. So now I've got that, I'm going to make my first save. So file and save as. Um, I'm just going to call this one workshop. There we go. Uh, call that MSA workshop. You can name it whatever you like, of course. But you are going to want to start saving often from this point on. Just a word of warning. <laughs> we will start getting a few crashes uh, appearing. Now, I'm aware that a lot of you are going to be using relatively slow computers. I had tons of emails this week about what should I do if I want to upgrade and things. Uh, so I'm going to assume that everyone here is running the slowest computer in the world. If you're not, fantastic. You have no problems with these next steps. But even on my machine, it sometimes struggles. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to basically create a rectangle that um, acts as my site boundary. So I basically want to draw a rectangle over this map so I can turn this map off and use the rectangle as a placeholder. So I'm going to make a new layer. I'm going to call it boundary. I'm going to double click it to make it my active layer. And I'm just going to click on its color box just over here on the right. And I'm going to color this red. So obviously nothing's changed on the model because we haven't drawn anything. But now that my layer is red and it's my active layer, anything I draw is now going to come up red and on that layer. 
Now, what I'd actually recommend you do is to make a rectangle slightly inside the boundary that you already have. The reason being is that we're going to project these curves onto the terrain at the end so we can split them up into surfaces for texturing for 3D uh, rendering and stuff. Um, so essentially, if these if the boundary is too big here, it's not going to work very nicely. That's what I'm trying to say. So I'm just going to make a rectangle over this site. And it's slightly inside where the curves are, only slightly. And all this means is I can now turn the map layer off. And now I've just got this boundary that represents my uh, file. It's going to have a quick sip of my coffee. Give me one moment. Oh, that's much better. Right, next step is going to be to bring in the terrain. So we need to bring in that point cloud data that we need to work with. I'm going to show you a couple of ways we can work with this. Um, first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to make a new layer. I'm going to call this points because we're going to bring in point cloud information. And again, I'm going to double click it to make that my active layer. I would then go to file and import. And I'm going to go ahead to my downloaded and extracted folder again. And this time I want to go to the one that says Terrain 5 DTM, Digital Terrain Model. The other one I downloaded was the contour information, which we don't want to work with today. And at the minute, as you see, I can't find my uh, my file that I'm looking for. Reason being is because the last file I imported was a DWG, so I need to change this again. So I'm going to change this to supported files. Go in my folder. I find the XYZ file. Click on open. And we don't even need to change any settings here. This is all exactly how it should be. The delimiter should be set to comma. So I'm just going to click on OK. And what this is going to do, it's going to import one million points, literally exactly one million points. So depending on how quick your computer is, determines how quick this loads. But what we'll do once they're all imported in is we're going to trim these down so they fit inside that rectangle. So there you go. I'm just going to deselect this. And currently I'm in my top view, as you can see. We've now completely lost that rectangle. It's very hard to find. I, mean, I, I could zoom in somewhere and try and find it. Just about see the boundary of it there. Don't actually know how I found that. But a much, much faster way to work is just to uh, restore this back to four views. And using our front and right view, we can see where that rectangle is. So you just about see that in front and right but we can see how much further those points extend past it. So I'm just going to zoom out of this view as well, just so we can see what's happening as I work on this. So all I'm going to do in my front view first, I'm going to click and drag to select some points. And the aim of this is to select as many points as you can without highlighting the uh, red rectangle. If the red rectangle gets selected, it means you've selected too many points, in which case deselect, try again, Keep selecting them until you don't select the red rectangle. And once you've selected them, just hit the delete key and it will delete that selection of points. Now, this again is quite a heavy process, uh, but essentially the more points you delete, the faster the file becomes. So I'm just going to click and drag from the left side this time. You can zoom in if you're using a mouse as well. Helps you find a cleaner boundary. That's a hell of a lot of points there, 752,000 points. Hit delete. As you see, this is now much faster to work with, much smoother. Should make selecting the remaining ones a bit quicker. So select that, hit delete. Then lastly, select the other side and also hit delete. There we go. And essentially what we're left with is bunch of points that loosely fit the rectangle. So something kind of like that. So we've got that red rectangle underneath, just as you can see. Doesn't have to be perfect as long as it's close. Um, just seeing as a question in the chat, missed what you said, you're just deleting the points outside the boundary. Yes, that's exactly all it is. 
because otherwise when we generate a surface over this it's going to try and do it for all of those one million points that came in whereas at the moment it, we just want to focus on um, essentially whatever was in that rectangle if i just turn those points off oh wrong, wrong button yeah we just want to focus on whatever was inside that rectangle basically so now that's trimmed down now that we've deleted them we can now save it again so i'm going to click file and save Again, you want to save after every main step for this. Um, and now we can basically generate a surface over this. Now, there's two ways that you can go about this. And I would say it completely depends how much accuracy you need and what you want to do with the model at the end. So, for instance, if you're looking to do a um, like a fabricated model, like 3D printing or CNC machining, realistically, you probably don't need tons and tons and tons of accuracy. In which case, you could just use the patch command. In, I'll show you how this works. So I'm viewing this from my top view. I've turned off my boundary layer. The only layer I have on is my points layer. Um, and all I would do is I would type in patch. I'm going to select all of the curves that I want to patch. Again, I'm doing this in my top view. I would specify the number of subdivisions for my surface in the U and V direction. So essentially, how much resolution do I want? Uh, and then I would click OK. If I just click OK at the moment, you see it generates a surface uh, over this, but it's not going to be very detailed. It's not going to be able to generate all of the resolution from these points because it's only defining it at each of these subdivided curves. So what you could do is select it all again, type in patch, and just increase the number of U and V spans. And the more you have, the more resolution and more detail you're going to have in your model. So for instance, if I do this 30 by 30, click OK, it's going to do some processing. You see there's now a lot more data to that surface. In fact, if I just go to my 3D view and set this to shaded, you see it's generated a surface. It's going to move that out of the way for a minute. It's given us this kind of surface. There's, there's not even much detail to this, as you can see, but it still gives me a rough idea of my terrain. Um, what I would recommend, if you're trying to make a relatively accurate site model using the patch command, the settings I would actually use would be about 150 by 150. So 150 by 150. It's going to take a long time to process, which is why I'm not showing it here now. But it will give you nice, clean surface geometry, which means you can extrude it, you can chop it up, you can work with it really nicely. Um, but again, I'm not going to do that now because it will take uh, way too long to process. Um, what I am going to do instead, I'm going to use just a little bit of grasshopper to connect these together. I'm sure some of you have just panicked by me even mentioning the word grasshopper. Don't worry, easiest thing in the world to use for what we're doing today. <coughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to type in the command grasshopper. And you'll see why I'm going to use this in a sec. And it's going to give that a second to open up. We've nearly built the model, by the way. You, you'll be surprised how nearly finished we are. Now, what I would actually recommend you do is select all of the points in the main Rhino window like this. And then in our grasshopper panel over here, I'm just going to double click or hit the space bar. And because we're working with point geometry, I'm going to type in the word point. And I want to select this one just here that says point. Should be in a little black hexagon with a white uh, cross through it. So this just brings in a point node. And what I can do with all of my points selected, I can right click on the point node, set multiple points. There we go. And that's selected all of those really, really quick. Now, what we can do, you see this is all turned red in my main uh, Rhino window. Reason for that is the original points are kind of colored white, but anything referenced in Grasshopper is going to be red. So what I could do, I could just move my grasshopper window out of the way for a minute. I could turn my points layer off. So now we're not previewing the same set of points twice, speeds it up. 
And now we're only seeing all of the points as grasshopper geometry. Now, what we want to do, we want to be able to make surfaces between each of these points. So the reason I'm going to use grasshopper for this is because it has a really useful node called the Lorne triangulation. And this is basically going to generate a series of triangles based on the nearest points. So I'm going to double click again. I'm going to type in DEL for Delaunay Mesh. And I'm just going to choose this green one that says Delaunay Mesh. And I'm just going to connect it. You see, if I hover over this output just here, I get this little icon pop up. I can just click and drag a little cable out of this. Because it's a point output, I'm going to plug that to the point input on this one. And you see it's now generated a much nicer surface over this entire model. If I were to zoom in, you see it's filled it in between all the points. Now we've got one more step to bring this into Rhino, because at the moment it's only being referenced from Grasshopper. Final step would just be to right click on our Delaunay mesh, uh, this node just here on the right. Right click on it, choose Bake, click OK. Now what this has done is it's no longer only being referenced as a red object in Grasshopper. We now also have a physical object in uh, Rhino that we can select. Because before that step, you see if I try and select it, there's nothing there I can actually select. It's all just referenced. But when you bake it and click OK, we now get that surface appearing. Um, you can now turn off Grasshopper. You don't need it anymore. You can also right click and just disable the previews. That's also another step you could do. But essentially, we've now got all of this extra terrain information. And this is the highest number of points that you can extract from uh, Digimap. And this is the highest quality you can connect them together in. It's the absolute highest resolution you get from Digimap, uh, which is why I wanted to show that process. Um, if you need higher resolution than this, that's when you're going to start looking into things like LiDAR data and things like that, or doing your own photogrammetry for, uh, scans with drones or smartphones. So this is about as far as you go with Digimap. But it's still pretty damn good, right? I'm impressed with that. If I put this into rendered mode, yeah, it doesn't really look that good. Annoyingly, I've chosen a site that's relatively flat, obviously being the city centre of Manchester. If I were to do a nice mountain one, this would look amazing. So now that we've generated our surface again, all I'm going to do, I'm going to make a nice new layer and I'm going to call this one terrain. I'm going to select my terrain that I've just made. Right click on the terrain layer, change object layer. And all that does, it just means that this is now on our terrain layer. So I can toggle it on and off, same as all my other layers. If you want to um, speed your file up as well, you could now also delete your points layer with all of those points on it. We don't need that data anymore. So I'm just going to delete that. And now we've got this looking nice and clean. Now there's one more thing we need to do to clean up this terrain. You remember that boundary rectangle that we made earlier? I'm going to turn that back on. If I just zoom in, you'll see that actually those points extend outside of that boundary, which isn't ideal. So if you did the first method uh, of using patch to generate this, then you'll be working with a surface object, in which case you can just type in the command trim. You can trim the surface against the red rectangle. If you're following the grasshopper method I just showed, then you're now working with a mesh object instead, in which case you'd have to use mesh trim, this one just here. So mesh, mesh edit, mesh trim. And it works the exact same way. So for instance, in the command line, it says select the cutting edges, which is this rectangle, press enter when done, select the thing to trim away, which is outside of the rectangle, and you see it trims it down. So now that's nice and clean. We've also got our map that sits just underneath it. Again, we're not going to play with that just yet. But essentially, we just got super, super clean geometry. And once again, I'm going to hit the save button. 
Now, it's up to you how you go about the next step. Uh, there's two ways you could go about it. You could either project the map onto your terrain. So remember, on our map, we had the, if I just turn this back on, we had the area or the hatches, I should uh, properly call them. We could project all of this information so it sits in 3D on top of the terrain. Um, or we could choose not to do that and just bring in the 3D buildings. But essentially, if you were going to bring it in and project it, what you'd want to do is select your map in your side view. And then I'm going to break my rule of moving things. I'm going to make sure my gumball is on, this one just here. And I would drag it upwards on the Z axis. I'm not going to move it left or right or back or forth or anything. I'm just going to move it up on the Z axis. And then in my top view, and with all of that map stuff selected, I could type in the command project, select the mesh underneath, hit enter, and it would project all of these curves so they fit in 3D on that terrain. Now that is usually a very slow process, so I'm not going to do that right now. Instead, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to show you essentially just with a single object how that works. Um, let me just turn the terrain off. So let's say, for instance, maybe this little bit of boundary just here. Maybe I want to project just this onto uh, my terrain. In which case, I select the object, bring back my terrain, type in the command project. Uh, it's asking me to select the surface to project onto, which is the mesh. Hit enter. And now it's projected in 3D onto my mesh which is really cool. And the reason this is really cool is essentially it means that we could now use that object. We can now use that curve to split this surface up, this terrain. So I've just turned that map off. We've still got that projected on. It's a bit hard to see at the moment because I, I should probably change this to like a different color so I can see the geometry better. Um, but now it's projected. I could ju just now split this up. So we know that the object I'm using is a mesh, so I would use the mesh split tools. Again, if you use the other method earlier where you did patch, you would use just the standard split tools. I'm going to go to mesh edit, mesh uh, split. The object to split is going to be the mesh, press enter. The cutting object is going to be our curve that we just projected, hit enter. And now they're separate objects. So you can imagine this is really useful, especially if you need to um, extrude something, for instance, pavements. You can now extract all of those as boundaries, select the uh, resulting surface and extrude it up. Or if you wanted to texture something, you know, you could bring this into Lumion, Twinmotion, Enscape, and now you could just select an object. Uh, we know this was part of the park, for instance. I could just grab a grass material and drag it onto this object now. So it's going to be a very, very, very fast way to uh, get your accurate geometry in three dimensions. Because again, three dimensional objects. So again, that's that bit. There is one more step um, for basically kind of completing this off. And that is going to be to bring in our 3D buildings. So I'm just going to save this one more time. And this time I don't need to make another layer because it's going to generate its own layer. I'm just going to go to File and Import. And I'm going to go to my master map building heights. Oh, and don't forget to change the drop down to supported files. Keep the settings exactly as they are. Just click OK. Let that process, might take a minute. And it's going to be kind of similar to that points uh, data set that we bought in, and that it's going to bring in way too many buildings but they will come into their correct locations. So it's just the same kind of process again. Just zoom out in your top view. We can quite clearly see where our boundary is now, so we don't need to do it in all the other views like last time. But it's just a case of going around, selecting all the buildings you don't need. And as long as it doesn't intersect your site, you can just hit delete. So I'm just going to go around, remove most of these. Anything like this, Obviously, just deselect. You can hold control and just click it. 
So that one's overlapping a little bit. So again, doesn't take too long to go around and clean it up. We're obviously going to clean this up just a little bit further. Um, for something like that, to clean it up just a bit more, I would turn off the terrain. So you're left with just the, um, the 3D buildings and your boundary. Um, all of the 3D buildings that download are mesh objects. So we're going to use the mesh trim. So mesh edit, mesh trim. Cutting object is going to be the rectangle. And now we can just go around and select anything that intersects it. So this is possibly the most boring manual process. Um, oh, nice one there from Patrick. Uh, dragging from the left will stop it selecting in the one area. Yep, sounds about right. Uh, another question, does the trim function only work when the different layers are grouped? Uh, no, no, it shouldn't do should just work, uh, work work as is. It'll work with any objects that are visible, essentially. It also used to be with previous versions of Rhino that it would only trim objects that intersect your cutting line, like this red line. But now with Rhino 7, you can select objects that are outside it and it will still delete those away, which is also really cool. So I'm just going to go around. Again, a bit time consuming, but it's fine. Just clean this up a bit. I actually quite enjoy doing this. And you can't click and drag uh, to do a mesh trim. You have to manually click each time on objects. And if the McNeil team or Rhino people are watching this tutorial back for any reason, please make that a function. Please make it so I can click and drag to trim meshes. <laughs> Worst task so far. Yep, completely agree. So again, it, it's not too bad. I mean, I've already done over half the model in about, what, 60 seconds? It's not that bad. There we go, nearly done. I am a perfectionist, so I probably don't need to go around and finish this off right now. But I'm going to because, again, perfectionist. I just want to show you how to fix the resulting meshes on this, just to give you an ultimate model at the end. There we go. Oh, a couple more. I think that's pretty much it. There we go. So now anything outside we know isn't going to be extending inwards. So we just do that final bit of cleanup. Just walk around the edge, delete any outliers. And everything should now be trimmed down to that mesh edge. So yeah, it wasn't too painful, was it? A little bit time consuming, but it's not too bad. Haven't found a way to automate this yet. I've been trying to write a few different scripts, but not getting much joy just yet. There we go. <clears throat> We've now got our boundary. So I can view this in 3D. And one thing that you're gonna notice, especially in your rendered view, all of those buildings that we just chopped through along that 3D boundary, uh, you see that they're now all open, which we don't want. It's not ideal. So one thing that we can do is quickly just go around, close these holes and then fix them. So again, it's another manual process, but it's not too bad. Now I'm going to show you how you can turn on uh, different colors for your back face edges. So for those of you that have ever had issues with 3D printing or extruding or booleans, anything like that, if ever it says that an object is open and you cannot work out where, turning on the back face edges will help you isolate where that problem is so, so quick. And to do that, you just go to File and Properties, and that will pop up with this window. Scroll down to the very bottom in this list and go to view. Open your display modes and I would recommend you do it in shaded. Uh, just because it's the least intensive of all of them. So I'm going to go to shaded. Scroll down a little bit and you'll find this option that says single back face color. And then you can just give this a color, whatever you want it to be. Uh, I quite like this nice magenta color personally. 
And all it means is anything um, essentially with a flipped normal or anything uh, that has an internal face, it's going to be able to show you in a different color. And what this now means is we can go around with the mesh, mesh repair and fill all holes tool. So it's just a case of clicking on an object and you see it fills it in. So I can hit enter to load up the last tool, select the object and it will fill it. So now it's just a case of mashing enter and clicking on the building to fix. Again, a little bit time consuming, but you see it's actually much faster than when we were trimming. Again, this is for the perfectionists now. Um, there we go, beautiful. Oh, zoom in, there we go. So you see what this one's just done. This one has just flipped its direction. We're going to come back and fix this one after. Super, super quick way. I've seen people manually going around and just re redrawing and rebuilding these. Um, you just don't need to. Again, it looks time consuming, but this is actually saving you days and days of drawing buildings and extruding. It's actually not too bad. I want we trim this one as well. I think that's all of them. Right, final, final, final step, final step of this one is when you now put this into rendered mode and when you zoom into those ones we just filled in, you see that they look a little bit janky compared to the rest. You've got the ones that we didn't trim over here that look nice and clean. And these ones have some weird issues. And essentially, we just need to tell those meshes to rebuild. So final step is mesh, repair tools, rebuild mesh. Set the object, hit enter, and you see it just repairs and rebuilds all of the normals on those meshes. So yet again, same steps. You just walk in around the uh, perimeter of the site, selecting, mashing enter, and it's going to be able to fix all of those for you. Now, I'm not going to go around and do all of this just because obviously we're a little bit wary of time. I do want to find that one that had an issue. Is it not this one? This one didn't feel for some reason. Oh, someone's unmuted their mic and is making a load of crackles. Thank you. If you get any ones like this, for instance, um, if I just zoom zoom selected on this, if I have a building like this where it's going kind of inside and outside like that, sometimes you have that happen. Um, all you need to do is go to rebuild mesh, rebuild mesh normals, and then my trusty favorite, unify normals. And you see it's now fixed it on this side. Annoyingly, it didn't fix it on this side. So if all else uh, fails, you, what you could do, if it's telling you it's a closed mesh in your command line, and if it still doesn't look right, you could type in mesh repair, which brings up this panel, click on check mesh. It will tell you that it's got one face or however many faces that have an issue. You could just go through and it will tell you where the issues are. So this has inconsistent normals. I could click on repair and it should go through and try and fix them. Got some disjoint pieces, so let's try and repair that. Now it's kind of separating these things out as separate meshes that we can repair individually. And you would just go around, do the same process. So rebuild mesh fixes them again. So I just wanted to chuck that in just for those of you that are going to be pulling your hair out in the pursuit of perfection. Fastest way to go about that. Now that we've got all the buildings in there and clean, we can turn on the terrain. All the buildings are sitting cleanly on the terrain. We've now pretty much got our first accurate site model, which is pretty cool. Uh, and as I said before, if you wanted to project those curves in 3D to be able to see all of your sidewalks, uh, your parks, any kind of attractions, things like that, you're now just going around and projecting your map curves onto the terrain. And you've pretty much got yourself a model. Um, in fact, you know what? We do still have a few minutes for this one. 
final step of course would be to bring in the map that i spoke about earlier if you wanted to add in a little bit of color to this you could do that as well so for that one i like to do this in top view i'm going to set this to rendered mode so we can see this and essentially that map that we downloaded the colored one uh, we would just bring this in as a material so i would go to my materials tab just here make a new material uh, I'm going to go to custom. Am I going to go to custom? Yes, I'm going to go to custom. I'm going to go to my textures and I'm going to find where I saved those textures to. So for me, it was this one. And it was this master map one to 1000, this TIFF file. So by bringing that in as a color texture, that's now made this material. I would select my mesh, my terrain to map it onto, right click the uh, object, uh, right click the material and choose assign to object. And as you can see, it clearly hasn't mapped on very cleanly. That's absolutely fine. There's no problems there at all. All we need to do is adjust the texture map. So I now just click on my uh, terrain. And the good tip with this is because we've trimmed this down to this rectangle, we can tell the texture to basically map to the rectangle, but on the mesh. It's a little bit confusing to explain, but hopefully you get it when I do it. So basically for this to work, I need to enable my snaps, but only my end snap. So I've disabled all of the other ones, I just unticked them. So to get this to map correctly, I'm just gonna select on my mesh and go to the object properties. I'll then go to the third one just here where it says texture mapping. And I'm going to apply planar mapping. And all this is asking is for me to snap to something. And I'm going to use my rectangle to snap to. I'm going to click in the bottom left, snap to the top right, hit enter. Now my texture is mapped on, which is pretty damn cool. So it's getting there, you know, it's, it's getting very, very close to being a really damn good 3D model. And again, if I were to go around and take the time and repair the rest of the ones on this side, then they would look as nice and clean as the ones that we've done over on this side. And of course, you know, you could 3D print the stuff, you could uh, put this into diagrams, you could render it out, you know, with proper materials and textures and lighting, this stuff looks fantastic, it looks absolutely amazing. So it just depends what it is that you want to do with it. But the whole point of this, of course, as we said repeatedly before, was that we're getting accuracy. We're getting actual survey data from this. So any changes in the terrain are accurate based on whatever surveys have been completed. I could extract uh, accurate sections from this now for my entire site, and it would be absolutely fine to use for planning permissions, for instance. But realistically, in the real world, when you're working on a real project, you probably want to go and do your own surveys and things just always more accurate. Right, I think that's pretty much it for that first model. Now, I'm just gonna have a quick sip of my coffee because it's almost cold. So that's model number one. Um, I think I do have a model that shows what it looks like with all of the terrain projected. Um, I'm pretty sure I downloaded it. Yes, I want to quickly show you this model. So this one was uh, built using the same process uh, once it loads. And this one is on the edge of the ocean. We're going to be moving to bathymetry next, so under ocean data. Now, using that same type of data, you can see I've projected the map on this model onto the terrain. It's a bit tricky to see because I've got multiple objects in place. Ah, crap bit messy in this view just because you can see all of this geometry there. But essentially, I've just projected all of those curves from the map onto the surface. Then I'll be able to select these and split out all of the little boundaries like roads and stuff so I can color and texture it. Now, the limitations of the standard Digimap data are that as soon as you hit zero on the z-axis or essentially sea level, it just flattens out. You lose all of that extra data underneath the sea. So this is, of course, a bit of a problem. And for that, you're going to need to download bathymetry data. 
So annoyingly, the site I've just shown you to model is obviously in a city center. So I wanted to show you something you're going to use quite often. There's obviously not an ocean connected to Manchester city center, but we're going to still walk through um, just how to process bathymetry stuff. So essentially, I'm going to go to the marine data set on Digimap. I'm going to go to marine data download. It's actually a surprisingly quick process. Um, zoom into the area that you want to capture. It's about as close to Manchester as I can get. It's going to be this kind of area over here. Let's just select a nice, oh, wrong one. Select a nice big area. Maybe I want all of these little alcove kind of areas. Um, we've got a few options to choose from. We've got vector data, which gives us basically vectors and contours and things and just general location information. We've got raster charts. So again, similar kinds of information. It's good for like backdrop mapping and standard cartography and things. And then we've also got bathymetry. And as you can see, this looks much, much, much nicer. And the cool thing about this is it downloads as an ASC file type. And ASC files typically can't be read by Rhino by default. They can, but not correctly. Um, but essentially what we can do is bring this into um, a proper GIS package, uh, like QGIS, which is free for Mac and Windows. That's what I'm going to use in a sec. Um, we can process this and generate some points to create a point cloud, and then we can generate that point cloud in Rhino and make a surface over it. So that's what I'm going to do. There are two different types of uh, point cloud here. And again, look at the level of detail. So the one that says DEM6 uh, or Digital Elevation Model 6, this gives you a, a relative scale or um, level of detail scale of 1 to 250,000. The other one is 1 to 50,000. So it's not super accurate. You're not going to get each individual stone, for instance. But for large areas, it's really, really useful. And it's much better than having just a flat kind of base. So to download that, click on DEM1, add to basket. You can choose historical versions as well if you wanted to choose how um, ocean beds and things have changed over time, if you're doing like historical mapping. Um, request the download and you will get an ASC file downloaded. So I'm just going to close all of these down. Let's close that. We're not going to work on that model any further. Obviously, again, you can extrude these if you want and make solid bases and things. It's up to you if you want to do that. Instead, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go to QGIS. So I know I said on Moodle and on our Instagram page, make sure you have QGIS if you want to do this bit. Again, you can just watch this back later if you don't have it installed. That's absolutely fine. It's going to wait for the software to open up. There we go. Right, QGIS. So first thing I'm going to do, um, I'm just going to open up some notes. Give me one moment. So I have a link that I'm going to give you all. So there's a few things that I'm going to be doing. Uh, one of the ones I like to do is just to install a, a little plugin just so I can check um, kind of heights of data, which is really useful. Um, so one thing you could do is just go to plugins at the very top of the screen, click on manage and install plugins. It brings this one up. If you search for the word profile, you see you get this one called profile tool. Um, you can just click on that, click install plugin. I can't click that because I've already got it installed. It just installs a plugin for you. And it's the same process for any additional plugins that you're going to be using. I see Josh has just asked a question. Would river bathymetry data fall under marine or ordnance survey? Very good question. Um, the answer is possibly. Uh, it could essentially fall under either. So if it's a very deep river, for instance, coming from like an ocean bed, then yeah, chances are it'd be within the uh, bathymetry data set. If it's uh, kind of more within like a land mass, and if it's below, if it's above sea level, sorry, if it's above sea level, chances are you'd find that more in the standard Digimap downloads um, kind of area. So it's just a case of having a look between. 
But remember as well, there's also LIDAR data. Um, and it's the same process here for working with LIDAR data too. Um, so chances are you'll be able to find nice LIDAR scans of rivers and things. But typically, if ever you can't find them, contact the uh, council for that borough that you're working with. Ask them if they have any point cloud information for rivers, things like that. They can usually send you links to databases to obtain things. It's a much nicer way to work. Right, we are going to process some data. So before I go ahead and import anything in, I'm going to change my coordinate system. So in QGIS down here in the very bottom right, you've got this one that says EPSG 4326. I'm going to click on that and that's going to pop up. Oh, I've lost it. There we go. Sorry, too many screens again. Uh, it's going to pop up and we're just going to search for British National Grid. There's a couple of different types of British National Grid you can choose from. The one that we're going to use has the authority ID of 27700. The reason I know this is when I go ahead and download any of the data from Digimap and look in the release notes, it tells you the coordinate system they're using for each data set. So that's where I've got this information from. I'm not just magicking it out of thin air. Uh, always double check at the location where you download data to find out what coordinate systems they use. So this is using British National Grid pretty much for all of Digimap's data, to be honest. So that just means I'm going to use that, click Apply, click OK, and now I'm using EPSG 27700. So that sets the coordinate system. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Sorry, I'm just thinking, what do I want to do? Yes. At the moment, I've got these options here that say Google Maps and terrain and things. You probably won't have those by default. What you can do is you can right click on where it says XYZ tiles. and You could choose new connection. Uh, there's a URL that you can enter, um, essentially just referencing like web locations. Um, and I actually got this information from a website. I'm going to put the link to this website in the chat and I'll try and remember to upload this. I'll add it in the comments, hopefully, when I upload this to YouTube. There we go, I've just put this into the chat. But essentially, it's got some really useful links for Google Maps, Google Satellite, things like that. And you can just copy these links, add them into new connection into URL, click OK, and you're good to go. And all that means it will do is it will add these little panels here. So for instance, the Google Maps one, I could now that I've just entered the URL from that website I just showed you, I can now drag this layer into my layers panel. Pops up with this page here. Just click OK on this. It's fine. And essentially what this does is it brings you a world map just so we can see where, th where our data is going to be located. So again, a little bit of a process. It's, it's not too complex. Just a case of right clicking on that new connection enter the URL from the uh, website I just showed, drag it into the panel. So next step is to find our bathymetry data. So I'm going to go to, let's just say I've received that email from Digimap, it's downloaded, um, and I've now got my extracted data, which should look something like this. So I've got a folder, I've got my DEM1, DEM6. I've already forgotten which one was which, which one was the higher resolution. DEM1. So we're going to use that. And inside you'll find an ASC file. Now, unless you're working on really huge projects, you should only be needing one uh, tile at a time. And I would recommend you only process one tile at a time anyway, even if you are working on a bigger area, just because of the number of points that are involved. It, you won't be able to save enough points to a CSV file, essentially. It has like an upper cap of like 125 million, I think. And I, we, we, want, we want to cap it at a million anyway. So essentially, try not to merge these and put them into one big CSV. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to pull up that folder. I'm just going to drag this ASC file into my layers palette, just down there. It's going to take a, a second to process. You see it's generated this layer just there. If I were to zoom into where that location was, remember I 
did it from up here. You'll see I'm now seeing the ASC file over here. Oh, someone's just commented saying the screen is black, as in my screen. Can you not see my screen sharing? OK, it's working for now. It went off for a moment. Oh, I don't know what that's about. It's working now, though, right? <laughs> nice. Cheers, Patrick. <laughs> Some great comments there. OK, as long as you can all see it, that's the main thing. So as you can see, it's downloaded this single tile of bathymetry data, and it's going to be cropping it against all of these kind of land edges. And the great thing about this is this is exactly where the land data from our last model um, kind of ends. So essentially, the data from this, we could trim away at that edge. The data from the other model we made a minute ago, we could trim at the same edge. It's just a case of merging them together. What I'm going to do, I'm going to quickly stop sharing my screen and reshare, just because I can see some people are still having issues uh, viewing my screen. It might be me, you never know. Um, hopefully I'm sharing the right screen. Right, I'm going to ask you all to let me know if it's working again. I know you all just said it was working. <laughs> is, it, is it working still? You can see my screen. Yay, perfect. Right. So now that we've got this tile in here, there's a couple of different things we need to do to process it. So first thing is I'm going to select that layer that we just uh, brought in. You see I can toggle these on and off. So it's kind of almost like Photoshop a bit in a way. So I'm going to select that layer and just up here in the processing toolbox. Oh, if you don't have the processing toolbox there, click on the processing drop down at the top, click on the word toolbox and it should appear. You should then get this panel. Now I can cheat here because I've already run this session before. Uh, so I can see my recently used things, but there's two, two commands that we need to basically use. The first one is raster pixels to points. So I'm going to double click on this one. You could just type in the word pixels to points and you can find it that way. But I'm going to use raster pixels to points. And the key thing to do with this one is we're going to set our raster layer, which is this nice uh, map that we just put in, not the Google one, but our ASC file. Make sure that is our raster layer. And under field name, we want to set the value as Z. In fact, let's do it as a capital Z or Z for the Americans. Uh, so field name Z. We don't need to select anything else. Uh, everything else is all fine. And I'm just going to click on run. And what this is going to do, it's going to take every pixel from uh, this file, this ASC file, and in the very center of that pixel, it's going to generate a point with a uh, height coordinate. So it's creating a point cloud. But the problem with this is it's only generating a height coordinate, a Z value. It's not generating an X and Y value. Yeah, that's still associated with a pixel. So now that's processed. You see we've now got a nice new layer called vector points. Um, it's finished processing. It says the word finished, so it means I can close this. I could turn the other layers off if I want. If it's feeling a bit slow, that's absolutely fine. I prefer keeping the Google one on, just I think it looks better. But essentially, now that this has generated all of the Z height values, we now want to also add values for X and Y. So I'm just going to go back to my processing toolbox. And the next one, if you just type in X, Y, you'll be able to get to add X, Y fields to layer. Again, make sure the correct input layer is selected, which is the one that was just created, this vector points. Uh, we don't need to select anything else here. All we need to do is choose where to save it to. Um, where do we save it to? There's usually a button that says where I can save it to. Ah, save to file. There we go. So I can choose to save this to file if I wanted to. In fact, you know what? Let's not complicate it. Don't click anything else. Just click run. We can export it separately after. So you see it kind of scanning through. 
click on close. So because I complicated that a bit, all you needed to do was click on XY fields to layer and click on run. You don't need to change anything. Just make sure it had the correct layer selected. So now what we got, we've got our um, original Google Maps. We've got our ASC file that was imported in. We then generated the Z height values, and then we added the X and Y values to those Z points. So the field, the layer that we want to work with now is the added fields layer. So all we need to do is right click on the added fields layer. We're going to click on export, save features as, and we just need to choose a location next to where it has file name of where to save it to. I'm going to call it this one, just so I know which one to choose. Obviously come up with better naming systems than what I'm just showing. Um, Yep, that looks good to me. So I'm going to click on OK. That's going to save out. And as you see at the bottom of the screen, you've got a little loading bar there. It takes a little while to process, um, but I'm just going to give that a minute to do its job. And we've got one more job to do with it before we import it into Rhino and clean it up. So I just need to wait patiently for this to, to save out now. And after bathymetry data, I'll show you how to get that really cool map in, the Google Maps one. Going to be using a little bit of Blender for that process. There we go. That's saved out. I can now close this, hopefully. I think that's saved. Either that or I just killed it. I'm not sure. Let's just minimize that for now, just in case I ruin the export. Um, I'm going to go to where that file saved to. So bathymetry folder. Yep, there we go, it's this one just there. So this saves as a CSV file, which as I'm sure you all know is an Excel file. So I'm gonna double click and open that. That's gonna open up in Excel. Uh, it might tell you it's read only, that's absolutely fine. You can just click on read only if it appears. Mine's popped up in another window, so I need to wait for it to come to life. So now that I've opened that file in Excel, the problem at the moment is that because we generated those Z coordinates first, they've gone into the first column, and then we generated X and Y. Rhino wants to read these in alphabetical order, so X, Y, Z. So all you need to do is click on the A column to select it, drag the data over across to the D column, like that, so now it reads X, Y, Z. Click on the A column again, right click, choose delete. Now it's all ordered, so X, Y, Z. Uh, we would then save this again as a CSV. I'm going to call it this one too. Let that save out. That is now ready to bring into Rhino. We've now just generated a manual point cloud. So I'm going to go to my Rhino source. Let's open that up. And this, this is kind of similar to what you'll come across when you're working with LiDAR data as well. I'm sure some of you might have tried downloading the LiDAR data, and when you bring it in, the points look all jumbled, or they look really squished into a line. There's a reason for that. I'm going to show you what happens with that now. So for those of you downloading LiDAR data sets, this is where you watch it from. So I'm going to go to File and Import. I'm going to go and navigate to my bathymetry file. And it was this one too. That's the one I just reordered. Again, keep the same as before. So del delimited by comma. Going to click OK. It's going to bring in a bajillion points. So we're going to wait a minute or two for that to process. Go make yourself a coffee or something while it's doing its job. I'm going to drink my coffee in the meantime. And that's imported in. So if we wanted to zoom into this, I would just type in the command ZSA, zoom selected all. Or if you've deselected it, ZEA, zoom extents all. And again, because there's a ton of points, this is going to work very slowly until we've finished processing it. So some of you might find this process too frustrating and too time consuming to go through. But you see what's happened here. So in our top view, this looks about right. 
This looks really similar to the shape that I extracted, yeah, um, from QGIS. But in our side view, all of that data is massively stretched out on the X and Y axis, um, on the Z axis, sorry. Now, the reason for this, if you have a look in the uh, notes, the readme notes from Digimap, the XY scaling is different to the Z scaling. Uh, and it's off by a factor of 50 when you look into those notes. So what we're going to do, we know the Z data is correct. It's just the X and Y scaling that's incorrect. All I'm going to do is zoom into the very top left. Doesn't have to be top left. It could be anywhere. But zoom into the very top left of the point cloud with it all selected. I'm going to make sure I have my point uh, snap enabled just down here. And I'm going to type in scale 2D. We don't want to scale it on the Z axis, the third dimension. We only want to scale it on the X and Y. All I'm going to do, click a point to scale from, which is the very top left point. Point to scale to, which is the point next to it. And then the scale factor, I know it's off by a factor of 50 because I've read the release notes on Digimap. So I'm going to type in 50 and I'm going to hit enter. I'm going to wait for that to scale all of those points two dimensionally. And then wait for that to process. And then at last, we will have our 3D points in Rhino as a point cloud to scale. And it's going to be absolutely lovely. Hopefully it doesn't crash. In the meantime, I see there's a thing from Molly. Uh, I'd like to do bathymetry data in a thin strip from the shore to three to five miles out to sea. Is this possible? How big are the tiles? Yeah, so you can get a, an idea of the tile size on here. So you can download, well, I downloaded a massive tile. And that downloaded just as a single tile that way. If you needed to just do a smaller area, if you didn't want to process the whole thing, you could either just delete the points after you've processed it in Rhino. So for instance, if I zoom out of this massively, let's just do ZEA, that's going to be much faster. I could just trim the points down and then generate a surface over it after that. Or I could hunt around online for a good uh, ASC editor and I could just crop some elements out. Or if you're processing it in QGIS, there are ASC cropping tools you can use. I personally don't use them because I find them a bit hit and miss. But you could download one big tile and then just crop out the areas you don't want to process and do it that way. You, you'll find other guides on YouTube for that. But for now, I just prefer process, processing the whole thing. Uh, Nasheen just said, uh, is that the same for every map, the scaling factor issue? Um, it's the same for every map when you're working with the LiDAR and bathymetry data, but not with the standard map stuff that we worked with earlier. Uh, I believe it's always a factor of 50 for that bathymetry data set that I just used. But key thing is just to have a look in the release notes and just see if there's any scale factor issues that have been highlighted. Chances are it'll tell you exactly uh, what you need to know. Right, I am going to go to my 3D view now. So if I deselect this, let's have a look at what we got. Obviously, I've not generated a mesh or a surface or anything yet. Let's let that deselect. Again, there's a ton of points here, so it is going to work very slowly to begin with. So you do need a lot of patience. Obviously, we have an absolute ton of data here that we can work with for that area. Oh, don't die. And I would just do the same process as earlier. So I would load up Grasshopper. I'm going to do this as a mesh because we want to generate as much detail between these points as possible. Same process again. I'm going to bring in a point input. So I've got my point node. I'm going to select all the points. Wait patiently for them to get selected. Right click the point node and choose set multiple points. Oh, it's really struggling now. I've been giving it abuse for what hour and a half or something, so I can't tell it off too much. And again, we do have is that nine million points there? 
Nine million three hundred seventy-nine. Oh no, nine hundred thirty-seven thousand nine hundred and two. Okay, it should be fine. There you go. Set multiple points. So that's now referenced in Grasshopper. And then we could just either hide these points in Rhino or move them to a layer and turn them off to speed the process up. That's still doing some thinking. Again, you really do want to grab a coffee or something while uh, while it does this process. There we go, hide those points. Once those points disappear, the final step is just to connect it to another one of those um, Delaunay mesh nodes. So same as we did earlier, Delaunay mesh. Now, one thing that's worth noting, have a look at the boundaries of all of this. What's going to happen is when I connect my points output to the points input on the Delaunay mesh, it's going to generate all of the surface across this. But it's also going to try filling all of these open areas. Now, that sounds like a big problem because you're like, well, how do I know which boundary is which? But once it's processed, you'll see exactly how we can clean that up. We can actually do it very, very quickly. There's just a case of merging it with our other model, just moving it into place, uh, making sure it aligns to the vector map, essentially. There we go. So that's now defined there. I'm just going to quickly bake this, same as we did earlier. Click OK. So that's baked out. And now I'm just going to turn off the previews for these. There we go. So moment of truth, if I now put this into rendered mode, we should now have some pretty fantastic land data that goes under the ocean, which is pretty awesome. Now, at the moment, problem we have, remember I said it was nice and trimmed against the edge of the, uh, the land, and now it's all kind of filled in. That's because it's approximating between these points. It'll do it to the maximum extent. So it doesn't know that we don't want to fill this in. Now, luckily for us, we can see exactly what bits don't match the rest of the model. You know, all of this is nice and highly detailed. Everything else we just need to remove. There's a little bit of manual cleaning. Because it's a mesh object, you just go to Mesh Edit or Mesh Edit Tools, Extract Faces. And all you need to do is just click and drag to select some faces. Once they're selected, you can hit Enter, hit Delete, and it will remove those faces that you're trying to select. So same thing over here. Just hit enter again to load up the last tool. Hit enter, hit delete, and you see you start getting all of your boundaries back again. And again, I'm not going to go around clean the whole thing up because we're tight for time. But once you've got your whole land boundary cleaned up again, all you'd need to do is combine this. So copy this mesh onto your other file, the one that we worked on in the beginning, if it was near the ocean, for instance. And all you need to do is just move it into place, potentially adjust the scale a bit um, so that it fits the rest of the model. You're just matching the, the vector drawing, essentially, until the coast of this matches the coast of the drawing. And that's how you get all the ocean data processed. Whew. God, I've been talking solid for nearly two hours. Right, I'm sure you all want to see the final uh, process, which is the Google Maps one. So for those of you that joined late, you probably haven't seen this one just yet. But I'm going to quickly show you how you can process uh, or how to import Google Maps uh, data into Rhino, 3D Google Maps, so that you end up with something that looks a little bit like this which suddenly looks way more impressive than everything we've just been doing. But the problem with something like this, and this is why we don't always recommend to import from Google Maps, is when you actually import into it, look how low resolution the uh, terrain actually is. It's really, really low res. The same thing with the buildings. They actually look really nasty up close. And there's tons of issues with open edges and stuff like that. But that being said, the texturing is so good on it that it's still great for visualization purposes. It's still good for animations. And to be honest, it's still good to use as either background geometry or even just for referencing. So imagine if I were to delete out an area that I was working on, let's say, for instance, I wanted to work on All Saints Park, I could trim this away 
from my Google Maps model. I could then import this um, into my main Digimap model and adjust the scale so they match in location and orientation. And then I would have my more accurate terrain data and my accurate model data that I can then build upon. So again, it's up to you how you're merging these data sets together, but you can really combine some interesting stuff. Now, to generate something like this into Rhino, I know I've said it a hundred times, but I'm genuinely proud of this. Everywhere online will tell you that you cannot get SketchUp geometry, not SketchUp, uh, Google Map geometry into Rhino. We are going to do that today. So you're going to need a few things. Uh, first thing you're going to need to do is navigate to a website that I'm going to paste into the chat. And again, I will upload a link to this website when I upload this to YouTube. I'll just show you what this looks like. Let me just load it up. Let me just get rid of all of these bits. There we go. So essentially what you're going to need, you're going to need this plugin for Blender. And I'm not going to tell you to in, uh, install Blender first because you might need a specific version. Instead, we're going to work from the plugin. We're going to identify what versions of two other software we need to work with the plugin we choose, and then we go through it that way. So the plugin that enables us to do this whole process is this Maps Models Importer plugin. And if you scroll down on this page and go to where it says Installation, there should be a button that says Release. And this will bring you to all of the latest releases. Now, the key thing here is each release will work with a different version of Blender and a different version of a software called RenderDoc. And all of these softwares are free. Now, it's worth mentioning that all of these only work on Windows. So if we do have anyone here with a Mac, I'm very sorry, but this will not work unless you're running Boot Camp or Parallels or something like that. Uh, but again, you could use the university computers for this process if you wanted to or buy yourself a Windows machine, as we always recommend. So for this version of the software of the plugin, Maps Models Importer version 0.4.1, we can see that we need to have Windows installed. It will work with Blender version 2.93 or newer. It also works on uh, Blender 3.0. The most recent version of Blender is 3.1, I believe. So I'm actually going to use an older version today just because I've not been bothered to update mine yet. I'm using this version, 2.93. Um, just while we're here, let's navigate to that website. If you wanted to download a legacy version, you can scroll to the bottom of their page and you can click on where it says download. They've got previous versions. Um, and you can find in here uh, how to download previous versions. So every release is available for download. We can scroll down through the list until we find 2.93, which is this one. And then just download one that matches your operating system. So if you're using Windows, likely 64 bit, Go down to 2.93, whatever the newest version of that is. Find one that says Windows and then 64.msi. You download that and install it. You get the specific version of Blender that works with that plugin. Uh, I've already got that installed, so I'm not going to go through the installation process. Um, this plugin also works with RenderDoc version 1.13. So again, we go to RenderDoc, go to their website, Current version is version 1.18. Um, I could scroll down here and find the previous version, 1.13. Download the installer, let that run, and then I get that as well. So I'm just going to go back one last time. So that's pretty much it. That's just downloading the three main files. So we've got um, Blender 2.93 downloaded and installed. Let's say we follow that through. Same thing with RenderDoc 1.13, we downloaded and installed that. And we've downloaded the latest version that's compatible with those just directly from this page. There's a, if you scroll down a little bit and go to Assets, you'll find where to download that zip file for that plugin. And you don't want to extract that zip, just keep it as a zip file, that's absolutely fine. It's a little bit confusing, but once you've got those three things downloaded, install Blender, install RenderDoc, and then we're good to go. The next word of wisdom I will give you is that you want to close Google Chrome. So even if Google Chrome is your main software or whatever, you need to close it down for this to work. 
So if you're watching this back on YouTube, I recommend you just copy and paste this link into, dare I say it, Internet Explorer or Firefox or Opera, whatever you're using. Just run it in something else other than Chrome to follow the rest of the tutorial and come back to this point. So the next step you need to do, we're going to go to where Google Chrome is installed. So for me, I'm going to go to my local disk C. For some of you, it's going to be in program files x86, and then you would go to Google and so on and so forth. For me, I have the 64-bit version installed, which means I go to program files. I'm going to go to Google, I'm going to go to Chrome, go to application, and this is where my one is saved, my Google Chrome. It's a bit annoying, but it does get you there. I'm going to right click on my chrome.exe. I'm going to send a um, shortcut of this to the desktop. So send to desktop, create shortcut. I'm now going to go to my desktop, find that shortcut, right click and go to properties. Now again, I know this is very long winded, but it's because it's not an official piece of software. It's a very dodgy workaround that actually works really, really well. Um, but essentially what we need to do, we need to change this shortcut and add in just a little bit of code into this description um, so that we can basically tell this to run in um, debug mode, because this is how we're going to be able to capture the data. Now I'm going to copy and paste the bit of code that you need to paste into here. I'm going to put that into the chat. It's a fair old bit of code. And all I'm going to do, I'm just going to delete all of this out. I'm going to paste that bit of code into here. Again, I will do the same thing on YouTube as well. I'll put it into the comments section. The only thing worth mentioning is my one, the location where it says C program files, Google, such and such. If you are running the old, uh, like a, sorry, if you're running a 32 bit version of Google, Google Chrome, Yours would be um, C program files x86. So again, you just need to change the location of that little bit in the code. It will make sense. Essentially, just copy and paste it in. Chances are it'll be saved to the same location as mine. Click apply, click OK. So now that we've done that, if I just pull up this folder again, now that we've modified that path and we've clicked apply and OK, uh, that shortcut now looks a bit different. It's now running it, or it's, it's actually now made that as a little command rather than a little uh, piece of software. So what we need to do, we're going to um, basically open our other software now. We're going to open, in fact, let's just close this down. It gets a bit intensive. Yeah, we're going to open that piece of software called RenderDoc. Going to drag this to the correct window. There we go. So you've got this one called Render Doc. And the first thing I'm going to check here once you've installed Render Doc, I'm just going to click on File and see if we have the option that says Inject into Process. If you don't have that by default, don't worry. You can click on Tools, go to Settings, and then under General, you can scroll down a bit. Um, and there should be an option somewhere that says inject into process. Um, I'm pretty sure this is where it is. I do have this written down. Give me two secs. Yeah, settings general. If you can see it there, then brilliant. If not, don't worry. It might just not be there because I've already enabled it. But it is there. It is definitely under tools. Yeah. Yeah, tools, settings, general tab. Uh, yeah, I think I just can't view it anymore because I've already enabled it on mine. I think that's all it is. You get the option for it. But essentially, it gives you this option there, inject into process. So. Essentially, once everything's installed, you want to make sure Google Chrome is not running just yet. We're going to open Render Doc. We're going to double click on our new shortcut that we just created. 
And what this will do, it's going to open this up. It's going to open an instance of Google Chrome, a completely empty page. It's going to look as though it's crashed. Don't worry about it. But it's going to give you this little code just here, 20484. Do not close this and do not click on OK just yet. Instead, what we're going to do, I'm going to click on File, Inject into Process. I'm going to type in that code just here, 20484. What this does, it just finds the process, the CPU process. Um, they were just isolated. I'm going to click on Inject, and that should form a connection to that process. I know this is really confusing. You don't need to understand the science behind it. Once you've done that, once you've got that established, come back to where this uh, little box is and just click OK. And this will now launch Google Chrome in debug mode. And you should have um, all these numbers and things going across the top. So now we're back in business. That's all the hard bit over and done with. Again, follow that back on the video. Go nice and slow with it. It will work. It's just frustrating. I'm going to find our site again, Manchester School of Architecture. I'm going to go to Maps. I believe this does now also work with uh, Google Maps as well. Uh, sorry, not Google Maps, uh, Google Earth, which gives you even higher resolution uh, textures and geometry than the Maps version. But essentially what I want to do, I'm going to click on where it says Layers. I'm going to go to Satellite Mode. And I'm going to toggle this into 3D. So something kind of like this. And I just want to set it up, either zoomed out or zoomed in for the area that I want to capture. Now, final steps would be to come back to this software. And the first 10 times I was trying to get this to work following tutorials online, I could not get this to work for the life of me. And it's because all the videos online were telling me to capture frames immediately. Don't do this. Instead, tell it to capture after delay and just set this to about three seconds, something like that. And what you want to do, you want to click the button that says capture after delay. And as fast as you can, go back to where Google is. You just want to wiggle the view around because it has to be moving as it captures. And in fact, let's do these side by side so we can see what's happening. Um, there we go. Let's do it something kind of like this. Let's capture a nice square. So I've set my, my delay to three seconds. I'm going to click on capture after delay and straight away. Oh, crap. <laughs> I ballsed it up. Sorry. Let's delete that. Right. There we go. So I'm just wiggling that around. And as that wiggles around, you should then get this view being captured there. So I actually messed up explaining that a bit. Keep it nice and simple. Once it's established and you found it over here, you basically just want to set your delay to three seconds, click on the button that says delay, and then quickly go over here and just wiggle this view around because it has to be moving as it captures. Otherwise, it won't work. There we go. Now that you've got this thumbnail, you just double click on the thumbnail and this loads the data up over in the event browser. And as long as you have the ones that say color pass, it means it's likely worked. If it hasn't worked, just close and repeat the process. Keep doing it until you get the color passes appear. Now that we've got these, we just go to File, Save the Capture As, and you want it to save as an RDC file. Uh, let's choose a location to save it in. So I'm going to choose MSA Test, whatever you want to call it. Click on Save, and that saves it as an RDC file. And you can now close all of this and you don't need to click OK or anything on any of that. All of this stuff can just be closed now. Very nearly final step. I'm going to open Blender. And you'll see that once it opens, it's going to tell me my version is 2.93. Mine's 2.93.8. That's fine. It's still compatible with the version of the plugin that we were looking at. To install that plugin, you're going to go to Edit, go to Preferences, go to Add-ons, click Install, and you're just going to find where that plugin's downloaded to. 
So for me, mine's in my downloads folder. That's the one that says maps model importer and then whatever the compatible version is. Click install add on and that should install it. Mine's already installed, hopefully, so I shouldn't need to play around with that. Once you've imported it, once you've imported the add-on, you now just need to import the data. So I'm going to go to File, Import. I'm going to go to Google Maps Capture. This should now be available if you've installed that add-on. Uh, I'm going to go to where I've saved my data to. Um, it's one of these. So find your RDC file, click on import Google Maps data. This is going to go very slowly because it needs to do a lot of processing. It might look like it's doing nothing for like a couple of minutes, uh, but I promise you it is doing stuff. And you'll know when it's finished because it will populate stuff. If it comes up with an error window that says it can't process the data for any reason, then it's either likely because you're sorry. It's either likely because you have incompatible versions of either Blender or RenderDoc for the plugin you've installed, or because you weren't moving the uh, screen around uh, when you when you captured the data. It will definitely be one of those two things. So again, go back and troubleshoot. If all the versions of Blender, RenderDoc, and your plugin match, if they're all compatible, then the issue is uh, to do with the way that you're capturing the screen. You just need to make sure you're in motion as it captures. Um, you can, of course, delete the existing geometry. So Blender always creates a cube in the middle. You can just delete the cube. If you wanted to quickly preview it here to see if it came in with textures, you could click on the little rendered button just up here, viewport shading. As you can see, it clearly comes in with all the textures. Very happy with how this is looking. And then at last, to bring this into Rhino, we just need to click on where it says collection up here in the top right. We're going to go to file, go to export. We're going to go to export as FBX. Um, oh, wrong folder. We're going to do this one. Um, yeah, let's just save it there. Um, a name and a location so i'm going to call this msa test fbx um only final thing i would do as well is your up orientation up here in the settings change this to z because in rhino z axis is the up axis so z up uh, and i would also limit it to active collection because that's why we clicked on collection just up there export the fbx that's going to do a little bit of thinking might take a few minutes for that to process out. But then once we're in here, you'll see the size of the data sets. They're absolutely tiny. The, that entire model for that FBX is six megabyte, which is insane. Final, final step, we open Rhino. <coughs> None of this is going to come into any scale, by, uh, by the way, but it is going to give us some really nice looking geometry. Um, just going to go ahead, go to file and import. Go to where we saved it to. Is it this one? I think it was. Can't remember. Import that FBX. Oh, so just lost the window. Um, you don't need to change anything here. Just click OK. It's up to you if you want to scale it. it. It doesn't make any difference because it's not to any scale at the moment. But this will now bring in all of that geometry. And again, if we set this into rendered mode, we've now got all of this, which is pretty damn cool. It's not bad at all, is it? Uh, and of course, if you wanted to do any like sun studies and things, you could go to render, go to environment editor, which is this panel here, go to your sun drop down, and you could just enable your sun. And you can start adjusting things like time of day, location, orientation, stuff like that. Turn off the other lights, though, if you're doing that, of course. There you go, something like that. So now you've got full control over the orientation of your sun. 
you can set your angles, time of day. Uh, this is on manual control, so I'm just going to toggle that off, scroll down to the bottom. If I wanted to set an actual geolocation, and if I wanted to set a month, time of day, blah, blah, blah. Um, and obviously from this, you know, as I said, this isn't to any scale, but you could now copy this model into that first one that we did, which we know is geolocated and to scale. And all you're doing is grouping this together, scaling it up, moving it into location until it matches the other one. So you have two data sets, one that's accurate, one that's pretty. And then you can just chop and change between the two. Right, we are eight minutes over the session and I've got another ADD workshop today uh, that runs at 4 p.m. I think it's 4 p.m., hopefully. Uh, that's going to be looking into doing Bjark Ingle style uh, diagramming, extracting visual sections, plans, elevations and stuff uh, from Rhino models. And essentially, we're going to be working on a process to bring that into Illustrator to clean it up and line weight it, add a bit of graphic flair, then how to, how to bring those into Photoshop with infinite resolution. So for those of you that have issues with technical drawings that are pixelated, you will never have those issues again if you follow the next workshop at 4 p.m. today. Um, I'm just going to open this up to any final questions, if anyone has any, before we call it a day. Anyone want to shout anything out or type it in the chat? Nope. Nope, no questions. Okay, right. I am going to leave that there for today then. Hopefully you found that useful. I know it is a lot of stuff to go through. Um, but yeah, that should pretty much set you up for life now, I think. Um, that is every possible way that I can think of to work with data to produce a 3D model. And obviously, you know, you could use this for fabrication, visualization, etc. Right. Thanks, everyone. See you. Bye. See you soon. Bye.